everybody. Can everybody hear me all right? Perfect. Yeah, as Ted said, my name is Sam Goldberg. Um, I am the manager of data science and analytics for the New York Red Bulls and a project manager for Red Bull Soccer, the umbrella uh, company of our clubs. So while part of my job is writing code, building software, answering those pesky ad hoc questions, a large part is carving out um, our strategy of where we want to go and where we predict the field will go. Um, and so today we're going to theorize kind of how soccer and yes, I'm going to call it soccer, apologize, I apologize, I work for an American club, um, how it's going to look in the next 20 years and kind of respond to new trends. So I'm going to start with this statement. Soccer is 20 years behind baseball. Most of you have probably heard this, right? So if baseball or F1 are the gold standards of analytics in sport, well, rather than look at what they're doing strictly based from an analytics approach, we need to look at what changes have made to the sport to encourage those analytical approaches. So what does the next 20 years look like? Well, like I said, we can look to these American sports, such as baseball and basketball, um, for some inspiration, or, or F1 in Europe. But every time we game plan, both internally and externally in discussions, four main topics really reveal themselves as to where the game of soccer is going. So we're going to call these the four corners of the soccer future. And not the analytics future, but the soccer future, because these two things are intertwined. They're, they're not separate topics. They're the same thing. So the first is competitiveness. If spending starts to get regulated in Europe in the same way it is in America, how do teams react to this, not being able to spend as much money as they are used to being able to spend? From there, we go to player development. If you can spend externally um, at the rate you can't spend externally, how do you develop what you have uh, internally, excuse me? Third is scouting. If you can't, if you end up not being able to develop internally, how do you spend your money efficiently um, and creatively in the transfer market? And then the last is in-game decisions. Once you have your roster built, um, how are you able to make those 1% changes uh, very quickly? So we'll start with competitiveness, but before we get there, it's important to note these things are all intertwined and related. They're not separate issues. right? They all are constantly working with one another. So competitiveness. What are the consequences when you impose a cost cap on a league? So we'll start here with the number of champions in the last 10 seasons in Europe, or across Europe's top five leagues. The premise had five, La Liga three, and overall in the past 10 years, Europe has averaged 3.2 champions per league. Now, America is completely different. Uh, the NFL has had eight champions in the last 10 years, same with the NBA. MLS leads with nine champions in the last 10 years. So this is, this is in large part due to the cost cap imposed on these leagues. But on top of that, um, it creates a sustainable product because you have no idea when you turn into any, tune into any game who's going to win. So I, I, we're at a data conference. I have to you know, present some data. And it really backs us up. So we'll start with baseball. There's absolutely no correlation between spending and success um, whatsoever. The NHL has a hard cap. You have to spend up to a certain amount of money, um, or you won't be compliant. So there's no, no correlation there whatsoever. Um, the NBA has the biggest correlation because of big three spending. You can spend as much money, essentially, on 60% of your starting uh, roster, which is a huge amount. It's smaller rosters than pretty much any other sport. And then the NFL is similar in the sense that you have 95% of a cap limit. You have to spend a certain amount. So there's zero correlation whatsoever. Um, and this is a completely different picture to what uh, European soccer looks like. Salary spend and points are directly correlated. And this is only for one season's of, uh, worth of data. If you look across multiple seasons, uh, a higher correlation reveals itself. So simply put, and of course it's more complicated than this, but if you have loads and loads of money, you could probably build a, a decent team to compete for titles. So as spending gets regulated, teams will really have to do two main things. They'll have to get creative and efficient with spending, right? Because you're not going to be able to just spend on whatever you want. And you're going to have to invest into player development heavily. So this leads us to our second corner of the soccer future, player development. And American teams have really invested heavily into player development in recent years. So we'll start with an example from Major League Baseball or baseball in general. So we'll start with the guy on the left here in VR goggles. 
he is able to play in his game that's going to happen that night, the opposing pitcher, hundreds and hundreds of times before he even steps into the batter's box. Now, the kid next to him is hitting in a batting cage with hit tracks. This allows him val gives him valuable feedback on launch angle, exit velocity, metrics that you need to train with as a, a baseball player in the modern day and age. And this technology is available across the country almost anywhere you go. And you know, personally, I've, <laughs> I use these two things when I played it, and they're completely invaluable for your development. Now, the NBA is doing something similar with, with the NOAA tool, right? You have metrics like average arc and depth of shot, which give you player development plans from a data-driven side of things, right? It's not just a, a coach saying, oh, I think you need to improve on X, Y, or Z. It's actually cold, hard facts that we can start to give to players and work with players with, right? So don't just take it from me. So according to MLB executives, 15 to 20 MLB teams have pitching and hitting labs, while only one team had a lab 10 years ago. And 10 to 15 teams have markerless motion capture, while only three teams had it five years ago. This is millions and millions of dollars invested by Major League Baseball teams into developing players that they already have. Because that investment is smaller than going out and trading for a player on the open market. And in the NBA, it's a little bit it's in its infancy. While most teams are in the exploratory phase of player development, four to six teams have these data-driven player development systems. None had it five years ago. So you're seeing across a multitude of sports investment into their own players. But really, this is not the only place where player development is happening. It's already happening across soccer. You have, for example, SoccerBot, right? A tracking, tracking data being imported onto a 360-degree screen on a mini pitch. This allows a player to replay their actions from the game the night before with no physical load whatsoever. Or VR goggles. You can put yourself uh, in the shoes of an opponent that uh, has played the team that you're going to play in your midweek game. And you can see how they reacted to certain types of actions if you're a midfielder. And then lastly, we have pose estimation data, right? Which can allow teams uh, to measure and develop players' running form and fitness ability um, without the use of wearable GPS and from a scouting perspective. Right? This is massive for, for teams. So if your organization knows what a good development timeline looks like, and your organization knows what optimal biomechanics looks like, well, given that you have the data, there's really no reason you can't scout for it, right? So then you're measuring players internally the same way you're doing it externally, which is alignment. So this brings us to scouting. And so I want to start here in scouting, uh, as it's probably the most important topic out of all of these, with a quick overview. So we have OBV from our friends at StatsBomb, right? We have goals added from probably the smartest people in the world at American Soccer Analysis. Uh, you have expected threat from Karun, who spoke before me, and then a, pos a generic possession value model, right? So these metrics that currently exist in the field answer the following question, which is, are they a good player? Right? Do they contribute more goal difference than they take away? What these metrics don't answer is, why are they a good player? Sure, it tells you if they're a good passer, like a shooter, a, dri a dribbler, et cetera, but why do those actions occur in the first place? Is it scanning, situational awareness, soccer IQ, right? We, we currently, as a field, don't have a way to measure this, right? This is not a unique problem to any of our teams. This is us as a field. So how do we get to this level of granularity in the future? Well, in short, we model for it, right? It's a very simple answer to a very complex question. So I want to kind of walk through an example of what a, a potential model would look like in the future given that we have the data. So we'll start with this pose estimation data and, and tracking data aligned, right? And you know, we have a game on, on Saturday. A team drops three goals against us. This, this player scores a hat trick. And our team notices beforehand that he's constantly scanning before he receives the ball, before he makes a one-on-one -on, -one on goal. Now, we deduce, because you know, we've seen a game of soccer before, that scanning is probably a good thing. So we put our best team on the case to build a model on this pose estimation of proxy scanning, right? Is the Z direction of the head, let's say, different than the Y direction of the feet, whatever it may be, right? They find a way to proxy scanning based on video they've watched and the, uh, the data itself. And because your data team is fantastic, you know, you probably work for one of the best clubs in the world, 
you answer now a piece of what we call the context puzzle. Right? If we know why a player is good, that's context, and context is coachable. And really, we should be able to repeat this type of analysis for any biomechanical problem that exists, given that we have the correct data for it. So if we can apply this model across the world, we can find future performers faster. Right? Now we're not looking for guys that have already added goal difference to their team, given that their team structure, but we're actually finding guys that are better future predictors of adding goal difference, such as scanning. The baseball equivalent would be guys that throw really, really hard, pitchers that throw really, really hard, or guys that may not have an average or on base percentage, but hit the ball really, really hard consistently. Right? This would be the equivalent in soccer. And if you can train performance in the same way that you scout performance, you can start to make adjustments really, really quickly when it matters most, which is in games. Right, so this brings us to the in-game decision-making aspect of this, which before we discuss, I kind of want to, let's get an operating definition going. Right, so what is in-game decision-making? It's the ability to utilize data to affect the outcomes or actions of the game once the game has already started. Right, after your planning is out the window and the, the referee blows the whistle, that's when in-game decision-making happens. And there's two types of in-game decision-making. There's player adjustments or player decisions, and there's system decisions. Player adjustments are, if you're in F1, take the corners faster. Or if you're a soccer player, run more. Whereas system decisions are decisions that affect the team as a whole, like tactical shape changes or substitutions, right? things that are team-centric. So we'll start with a player adjustment example. Um, and of course, we're going to start with baseball. So a pitcher throws the first inning. And the in-game data team has their dashboard up. His spin is really good. Spin rate's fantastic. His command is OK. Um, but his velocity is way down. And we know that a baseball pitcher controls all of their actions, right? They start the sequence of events. Um, and the in-game data team are notified within the inning. So they immediately start to run models on their markerless motion capture through whatever data provider it might be um, for Major League Baseball. And they notice that the pitcher's front hip torque is way down. Right? Now, front hip torque is a huge predictor of velocity in baseball. So they're now able to radio down through the phones in the dugouts to the coaching staff. Hey, this is what we're seeing. Now, the coach can go out for a mound visit. Right? Nice view of Bull Durham there. Uh, can go out for a mound visit and speak to the pitcher. And now, where we had no information whatsoever, to start, we can just, originally we would say, oh, he's just having an off day. We now can mitigate risk by the end of the first inning or the middle of the second inning with lots of the game left to go and make the necessary changes if we need to. Now, how does this apply to soccer? Well, it's no different. Midfielder plays 30 minutes. We have the same dashboard, right? Fitness levels are good. Passing levels are okay, but the player's receptions in space are way down. Now, is this a tactical thing? Is this a player level thing? Uh, we don't know, so we put our in-game data team to it. It's a, they're the best in the world, right? So they look at our pose estimation data, and the proxy model that we built for scanning earlier in our scouting uh, portion of this chat um, reveals that the scanning for the given player is way down, way down for the game. So they take their iPads, and they notify the coaching staff on the bench or the data, future data coach that exists 20 years from now. Um, and at the next water injury break, the coach is able to give a clear coaching cue to the player to make an adjustment, right? These are things that currently exist in other sports that will exist or already do exist in sports, or in soccer, excuse me, um, and will continue to persist. System decisions look a little bit different. Uh, these are choices that a coach would make as a reminder that affect the team as a whole, right? <laughs> shape, et cetera. And the most common example, and I'm sure we've all seen it on Twitter, is fourth down decisions, which really answer the question, what is the change in win-loss probability here if we go for it rather than punting? Right? If we punt the ball away and give it to the other team, is that better for us to win, or should we run another play? Now, for the folks in the room that don't know about American football and uh, want a European example, it's no different than an F1. Safety car comes out on lap 23. What is the change in race win chances if we pit here versus pit in 15 laps? Right? 
These are real decisions that have to happen in real time. And by real time, we mean split seconds, right? That someone is working off of their gut feeling. Now in soccer, let's say we have a 4-4-2, we're playing a 3-4-3, right? And our coach wants to know pretty quickly, okay, there's a tactical switch. And if the opposition switches to a 3-5-2, what do we do? Right, that's a, a common question that happens on a bench. Well, what do we do? Well, what's the result win probability if we switch from X formation to Y formation, given game state, right? Obviously, given if we're up or down, time of the match, et cetera. We should be able to know these things fairly quickly. Um, and it's no different for subbing. The game is tied 1-1. What is the change in win probability if we sub player A for player B? Right, and you can apply this framework of thinking to aid pretty much any split second decision that you have to make, right? What is, the, what is the change of win probability if we make this decision? And what has the change been over, over time? So this overall covers really the four corners of the soccer future, but still one major question that we have to answer um, to get there, which is, how do we get there, <laughs> right? And the answer is, through the three C's. And it, it sounds really corny, but if we do all this research and we predict where we're gonna go, but we don't actually have a plan for it, well, there's really no point in doing all the research. So the three C's are culture, communication, and commitment. So without a thriving culture, we're always, data people, we're always gonna be the, the nerds in the corner running their models, right? So without this culture where people are encouraged to take risks and fail, it's almost impossible to succeed. The second is communication. There is so much low-hanging fruit at clubs, anywhere from booking the bus for the first team to set-piece design to you name it, data is probably involved with it, right? Now, if there's no communication between departments, this low-hanging fruit does not get chopped down off the tree. And it's a, it's a huge miss for your, your organization. It's a huge miss. And then the last part is commitment, which is probably the most important, important part. Right, you need this ethos from sporting directors, ownership, head coaches, to emanate really on down from the top down to say, look, well, it's okay if we fail, right? It's directly linked to culture. It's really okay if we fail, as long as we're trying always to answer the most optimal decision and we're using evidence to get there, right? We're not operating off this, this gut feel, right? This, this gut instinct. That, that's the worst thing for an organization's health. So to end, I'll leave you with this quote. There are going to be parts of the roller coaster that are going to be scary, that are going to be uncomfortable, but hopefully at the end of the ride, when we get off, you're going to want to say, let's do that again. This is from Paul DePodesta, the president of the Browns, who famously plays Jonah Hill's character in the movie Moneyball. And really, this quote encapsulates the analytics future, right? And it's, it's a nice quote just to have, but really only after you live and breathe this quote, and you're OK making difficult decisions, can your organization not only plan for the future, but really, really succeed in it. So thank you very much. Uh, please find me if you have any questions on the talk, and uh, it's good to see everybody here. Thank you.